When we concluded our study last Wednesday evening, we were in chapter 3 of the book of Revelation, and we had read uh, the seventh verse, which is the introduction to the church in Philadelphia, which is the sixth letter now that we're looking at of the seven letters that are recorded in Revelation chapters 2 and 3. We'd already pointed out some of the important events that uh, are emphasized in this particular verse. The angel to the church of, in Philadelphia write, He who is holy, who is true. We emphasize that holiness refers to the sinlessness of Christ and the truth refers not necessarily to true as opposed to false, but that would certainly be true. But the word true that's used here is understood more in the sense of the real one, the genuine one, the only one who can save us from our sins. He's the one who has the key of David. And we did not answer the question as to the meaning of the key of David. Now remember, this is the Lord Jesus Christ writing these letters to the churches that are in the area of the world that we know as the country of Turkey today. Representative of the churches at that time in that area Obviously, the letters would have been shared with other churches in the immediate area, and I'm sure that all seven churches were able to read the letters that were written to the other six churches, and they would benefit by all of the letters, but they would especially be concerned about the letter that was addressed to them. Now, why would Jesus be identified here as the one who has the key of David? There is a real important correlation between the Lord Jesus Christ and David. You remember that uh, God had been the king of his people. But they looked around and saw that uh, the other nations had earthly kings. And they wanted to have kings like everybody else had. And uh, in wanting to have other kings, they were actually rejecting the Lord. Whether they realized that or not, they were. Now Samuel realized that. And this really broke his heart. And God said uh, to Samuel, uh, don't worry about this. I know how you feel. I understand that. But these people insist upon having another king. And I'm going to let them have the kind of a king they want. And so they made known the kind of a king that they wanted. And when that man was selected, that pleased the people. What was his name? Saul. Saul man that stood head and shoulders above the rest of the people, a man who was very impressive, physically speaking, and a man who, to his credit, really got off to a pretty good start. The problem was that good start did not last very long. And it soon became very evident that the one that they wanted for a king was going to turn out to be a real disaster. And so uh, God is already making arrangements now for somebody to be his successor. And this time it's not going to necessarily be the kind of a man that anybody else would have chosen. But it's a man that God chose, which only underscores the fact that uh, what Isaiah wrote so many centuries ago, God's ways and God's thoughts are not ours. In fact, they're much higher, they're much better than anything that we would ever devise or consider ourselves. So one day, Samuel went to visit the house of Jesse. And he said, I need to see your sons because I'm sending a mission to anoint one of them to be the next king. So he looked at the various sons, thinking undoubtedly it would be the oldest son, but it didn't turn out to be, nor was it the next oldest. In fact, he had gone through the list of his sons, and he said, uh, is this all? Is there nobody else in your family? Oh well, yes, there's one more. Well, where is he? Well, he's out there taking care of the sheep. Now, he was the youngest of the whole group. A ruddy fellow, a real fine fellow. And Samuel said, well, I need to see him. And when David was brought in, uh, God made it clear to Samuel, this is going to be the next king. So not the kind of a man that men would have looked for, but the kind of man that God knew was going to be best for them. And so he was duly anointed as the king to take over the place of Saul. Well, that's going to happen in due time. 
But in the meantime, Saul is the king, and David uh, comes to know Saul quite well. In fact, he even marries Saul's daughter. That didn't turn out too well. But he did become a leader in one of the military units of Saul's army and proved himself to be a very able military leader and was able to do much good for Saul and for the people. But ultimately, Saul became insanely jealous of David. And for a long time, David was a fugitive. Now, his best friend was a son of King Saul, Jonathan. But even that friendship and the very fact that he had married one of the daughters of Saul did not really aid him in a good relationship with Saul. Saul needed to be dealt with, and God would do so in the appropriate time. Well, that time finally came, and when Saul died, uh, David became the next uh, king. Now, when David was the king, David is a human being. And the Bible makes it clear that we have all sinned and come short of the glory of God. And David is no exception. But he was a man after God's own heart. And he was a man that experienced the blessings of God in a very unique way. Not only in the military, but even while he was serving as a shepherd. God had given him the strength and the ability to protect the sheep from the lion and the bear, anything else that might be injurious to the flock. He is a very faithful young man, committed to the Lord. But he, like all people, faced temptation. And he became weak during the time of some of his temptations. As a result of that, he committed two really very serious sins. Unfortunately, many people only remember that about him. He committed adultery, and to cover that up, he positioned a man to be placed in the front line of battle for the express purpose of his being killed in battle. That man was the husband of the woman with whom he had an adulterous affair. Hopefully, he thought, this will cover up my sin, I'll marry her, and all will be well. But it wasn't well. And God knows everything, and he knows what he's doing. And he knew the time had finally come that David needed to face up to the truth. And so he was confronted by the prophet of God who told David a very interesting story that was very believable. And as he listened to the story, he thought, oh my, this is terrible. It's a story of a man who had uh, great wealth, but he had a company and uh, wanted to... Uh, take care of his company well. So he stole the only little ewe lamb that his poor neighbor had to feed his guest. Why would he do that? A man that had plenty without robbing somebody else, and particularly a poor man. Well, David was obviously infuriated. And as a result of that, you remember that David immediately responded to that news. That man needs to die. And that man needs to restore fourfold for what he has done. And Nathan looked directly into the eyes of David and said, You're that man. I'm not sure that David ever quit grieving. He became fully aware of the fact that you cannot hide anything from God. And he knew the only peace he would ever stand, uh, ever appreciate in his own life from that day forward would be the peace of a life that's spent trying to be the man that God wants him to be. The kind of man that he wasn't part of his life, but hopefully will be from this point on. So we notice a real change in his life. And God saw that too, and God saw potential in this man. Now all of this tells us that God has had to work with imperfect people, but God can do wonderful things through a person that is genuinely repentant. Now, in the class that I taught this afternoon, a student raised the question, which I answered gladly, and in my answer I referred to the 51st Psalm. If you want to know how a man truly repents of a sin for which he feels so badly, just read Psalm 51. Here's a man that's pouring out his heart to God. Full confession, 
genuine repentance, wanting to make it right. And God can see a heart that has been melted and a life that is wanting to be changed, to be like God wants him to be. And God honored that person and that desire. And so God, through the prophet, made known to him, David, your kingdom will never be destroyed. Somebody from your family will occupy your kingdom forever. And so from that point on in the Old Testament scriptures, we have the genealogy of David recorded for us. And sure enough, a member of his family was always on the throne. Even though they went through some bad times, even though the kingdom was divided, even though the northern king was carried away by the Assyrians and the southern king was carried into Babylon captivity, the throne of David continued through it all. So when you begin reading your New Testament in Matthew chapter 1 and verse 1, the very first verse of 16 verses that give to us the genealogy of our Lord Jesus Christ. And the two names that are mentioned in the very first verse are Abraham and David. And it gives us the genealogical record that the line continued from David to the time of Christ. And Christ being the ultimate result of that bloodline occupied the throne. And with Christ occupying the throne, it no longer becomes an earthly kingdom. It now is transformed into a spiritual kingdom. The same thing that happened to the nation of Israel. The nation of Israel was once determined by those who had been physically born into Jewish homes. But that day came to an end with the time of Christ. And with the time of Christ, the introduction was made before Pilate by Jesus himself as he responded to Pilate's question, Are you a king? And Jesus said, What you've said is true. My kingdom, however, is not of this world. If it were this world, my people would fight like your people fight. But it's a different kind of a kingdom. And it's the kind of a kingdom that Daniel had prophesied centuries earlier. The kingdom of which you and I are privileged to be a part. Now when I think of Jesus Christ, the one who is possessing here, the key of David. The word key to su suggests to me authority. And here is one who is the king of kings and the Lord of lords. Jesus Christ himself who said just before he entered into heaven, all authority has been given to me in heaven and on the earth. And exercising that authority, he then commissioned his followers to tell the world about this kingdom that will never come to an end. The Roman Empire came to an end. And all worldly kingdoms ultimately will come to an end. But you and I, who are privileged to be in the church, are part of a kingdom that will never, never come to an end. And the one who is the king is the one who has the key of David. There's something special about David's kingdom. Something special about the way in which God used David. A man after his own heart. A man selected by God himself. Not the kind of a man that the world would have chosen. That man failed. But the kind of a man that God can use. Perfect? No, no. In fact, the only one who's perfect is his offspring, the Lord Jesus Christ. And he's the one here that is writing all of these letters and is making them aware of his connection with David, the fulfillment of that promise that he made to David, your kingdom will never end. And somebody in your family will occupy the throne forever. And that person now we know to be the Lord Jesus Christ. Now in verse 8 
of chapter 3 of Revelation, he continues in the letter and says, I know your deeds. Behold, I have put before you an open door which no one can shut because you have a little power. You've kept my word and have not denied my name. Now, word studies have always been interesting to me. And word studies can really give you some insights that you will not gain unless you know the word that's being used. Now, people can describe things with a variety of words. But sometimes you stop and think before you speak and say, there is a word I'm searching in my mind for that is going to say this better than any other word. And you're trying to think what that word is. Because you just don't want to make a casual statement. You want to make a statement that is really pulling a punch. That's what happens here. When he says, I know your works. The word K-N-O-W is a translation of the Greek word that says, I know everything. There is not anything that's hidden from my vision. I have complete knowledge of everything that you have done. Now, why is that important to us? Do you think that any people think that they're hiding something from God? I'm afraid that happens far more than we want to admit. You can't hide anything from God. Does God know what's going on in the church? Yes. What does that mean? He not only knows what we're doing, but He knows what's going on in our heart that prompts us to do or not to do what is going on. So He says, I know your works. In other words, I know you're doing this Genuinely or hypocritically, but whatever it may be, I fully understand. I have complete knowledge. Now, when he talks about, behold, I put before you an open door which no one can shut, I think this is the open door of opportunity. I could be wrong. Some people say this is the open door to heaven. I, I don't want to argue with that. That may be true. He's the one that opens the door to heaven. You remember in John chapter 14 and verse 6, Jesus said, I'm the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes to the Father but by me. So he is the door to heaven. Jesus himself, while in his earthly ministry, said, I am the door. By me you enter into the sheepfold. You become my sheep, and I am your good shepherd. But I really think here that the door of opportunity may have been in his mind. Now, the thing that I think about here is when he describes this open door as something that nobody can shut. Have you observed in the New Testament how many times there's been an attempt to shut down world evangelism, to put an end to those who are spreading Christianity? Let's go back to the third and fourth and fifth chapters of the book of Acts. Peter and John have come to the temple. It's the hour of prayer. But they come to a beggar. He's a lame man, been lame from birth. On that occasion, Peter does not pass him by. Peter and John are there, and Peter fixes his gaze upon this man who is just there to receive alms. He needs some help. And Peter looks at this man and makes sure that he looks back and says, uh, I don't have any silver and gold to give to you. I don't think that Peter was broke. I just think he says, I don't have this to give to you because it's not going to really do what you need to have done. But I do have something to give to you and you're going to rejoice in what I give to you the rest of your life. And so he said, using the name of Christ, get up and walk. And he got up and he walked and he jumped and he leaped and he's filled with joy. And this immediately drew the attention of all the people. Gave Peter and John an opportunity to preach. And to point out, listen, you know what you've just seen? You've not seen anything that I've done. Peter wants that to be clearly understood. You've seen what the Lord has done through us. Now why did the Lord perform this miracle? Why did He perform any miracle? Any miracle that's been performed has been performed for one reason. To show that the man who performed this miracle is God's man. And the message that that man is preaching is God's message. That's a purpose. That was true in the life of Christ. That was true in the apostles. That was true with those who had the miraculous spiritual gifts. 
Now we don't need those today because we have the Word of God. And the Word of God will completely equip us for every good work. Scriptures make that very clear. And of course it's true. So, what happens? Peter's preaching and the people are listening attentively. And all of a sudden, the religious leaders get wind of what's going on. And they don't like this. Because they're not only talking about Jesus, they're trying to get the people to believe that this Jesus whom they had crucified is now alive. They don't want to believe that. So they've got to silence that message. So they send some people to arrest Peter and John and take them prisoners. Now they spend the night trying to think what they're going to do to them and how they can really stop them. By the next day when they stand before the high court, they don't really have any ground to stand on except for the fact they just don't want him to preach. And so they simply give them a threat. Don't you ever again preach Christ crucified and resurrected. You don't do that. Remember their response? We hear what you say. But we're choosing to obey God rather than man. And so they left. They spoke very humbly, but they spoke very factually. What they do, went right back to the temple area and continued preaching. So a short time later, the other apostles are there, and all of them are there now, and they're preaching again. And the high court, the religious establishment of that day, realizes what's going on. And so once again, they arrest them. This time, they arrest all the apostles. What do they do? They put them in jail. They're going to stay there overnight. Next morning, they're going to convene court about 10 o'clock in the morning, which was their usual hour to do so. And so they sent somebody to the jailhouse to bring them. When they went to the jailhouse to get them, where were they? Gone. They were gone. You mean somebody opened the doors? No, no, no. Somebody's been on guard all the time. You mean this prison door has never been opened? No, it hasn't. How'd they get out? We don't know. Well, they're not here. We know that. Well, they are here last night. We know that. But they're not here now. How do you keep somebody in prison that won't stay? Obviously, they're trying to once again slam the door and prevent them from preaching. And so a second time, they threaten them, all of them. And how'd they answer this time? Same way they did before. We're going to obey God, and they did. Now, throughout the book of Acts, and the New Testament Scriptures, we have many, many occasions in which the devil has tried to slam the door for the church. <laughs> Still happens. Still happens. Satan would like nothing better than to silence the Christian message. You can't do that. There are too many people that are really surrendered to the Lord. This church was surrendered. And he is indicating this when he says, I have put before you an open door which no man can shut. What does that mean? The Lord says, you're going to have an opportunity to let your community and the world around you know about Christ. Don't worry about it. You will have that opportunity. And there's not anything that anybody else can do about it. In Philippi, when Paul and Silas were put in prison, that was to silence them. It didn't silence them. Just gave them a different audience. A very impressive audience. Who's he going to preach to now? Well, what about the jailer? And the jailer's family? And what about the fellow inmates? God has ways of opening doors. God has ways of sometimes changing the course. It's not always as we had planned it. But you can be sure if you're serving the Lord, He will keep doors of opportunity open. We just need to be ready to walk through the open door. So I see here the open door being an important blessing for this church because this is the Lord saying, look, there's an open door. I am the one that gives this open door to you. And don't worry about it. Nobody can shut that door. Now he says, you have a little power. I really like that statement. If that had been me talking, I would have probably said, Man, you got great strength. And I would have been exaggerating. I kind of like to exaggerate. 
I kind of like to see think things are maybe better than they really are. The Lord's very honest. You've got a little power. Why did he say that? Can God work with something that's little? He always has. And he always will. And you may be little in the eyes of your fellow man, even in your own eyes. But don't ever forget, no one of us is so little that the God cannot do something great with every one of us. You've got a little power. Now, honestly, does this mean what I've just said? Maybe not. Maybe this simply means you're a very small church. But just because you're a small church, don't think that therefore you're insignificant. By the way, I want you to consider this. As far as I know, in talking with others who have made a study of this, do you know where most of our preachers have come from? Little churches. Not the big churches. Not the mega churches. Now this is not to say that big churches don't send people in the ministry. Don't misunderstand me. But when you look at all the people in the ministry today, and in days gone by, just check it out. Most of them come from a very small congregation. Can great things happen from small groups? Oh my. This is why small groups meet together to pray. This is why God used a small group to equip them to start a campaign to reach the whole world. Twelve men. One of them conked out on him, had to get a replacement. That's a pretty small group, you know, to go out and win the world. That's exactly what he did. And they did a pretty good job in their day. And they started something that hasn't ended yet. And it's not going to be ending as long as you and I are at the post, on duty, doing our job as our commander-in-chief has commanded us to do, to get the good news out there. And of course, you've heard the testimony that several of you have given already this evening of the wonderful things that happened here last Lord's Day. So, uh, he says you have a little power and you have kept my word. Now, I really like uh, the fact that they had kept the word. That suggests to me their faithfulness. And uh, we need to uh, appreciate how important it is that uh, we remain faithful, that we do not deny his name, that we... Uh, are not ashamed to say, well, this is what the Bible teaches, and that's where we stand, and we're not going to change it. We're going to believe exactly what God has told us to believe. And he commends them further in the final part of verse 8, and have not denied my name. I like that. You remember it was uh, Peter who said, don't ever, don't ever be ashamed to be called a Christian. I think that uh, that's a beautiful name. A name that was divinely given through Paul and his companion in Antioch, where they were first called Christians. Christian is someone who belongs to the Lord. That's who we are. We are God's people. We are God's soldiers. But there's something special about the name Christian. One who belongs to the Lord Jesus Christ. Don't ever be ashamed of that. Now, in uh, verse 9, Behold, I will cause those of the synagogue of Satan who say that they are Jews and are not, but lie. I will make them come and bow down at your feet and make them know that I have loved you. Now, where have we already seen a reference to the synagogue of Satan? One of the very first letters that we studied, the letter written to the church in Ephesus, back in chapter 2 and verse 9, uh, we had a reference made there to a synagogue of Satan. Now let's just refresh our memories what that means. A synagogue is where you gathered together. When uh, the Jews were scattered throughout the world, uh, many were scattered so far that they just couldn't come to the temple as often as they wanted to. Uh, particularly during the time of Alexander the Great, when Greek power dominated the world. He invited a lot of them to go with him down to Egypt. And they helped him establish the city of Alexandria. And God used that dispersion 
for a very important purpose to provide uh, sustenance and protection for the baby Jesus when Herod wanted all the babies around Bethlehem to death. Well, Joseph and his wife took the baby and went down to the land of Egypt where, until it was safe for them to come back. Well, they had Jewish friends down there. But with the Jews scattered, they needed a place to meet together. And so it was during the intertestamental period that the synagogues came into existence simply to meet a need. We need some place to meet together. And uh, so in any place where they had at least 10 heads of Jewish families, they were justified in establishing a synagogue. Now they could have more than that, but they had to have at least that much. But there would be many, many synagogues in the larger cities. And this is the place where they met together. So when he talks about the synagogue of Satan, he's talking about these people that get together and pretend to be the people of God. They're meeting in the right place, but they're not my people. And were the Jews guilty of pretending to be the people of God when they were not? Oh, yes, they were. The Jews were not acting for God when they crucified Christ. They were acting on behalf of Satan. They were opposing the Lord Jesus Christ. And the opposition that the early disciples faced was opposition to a large degree coming from Jews. When they meet together, they meet together as those who belong to Satan. In John 8, 44, Jesus was addressing a group of Jews when he said, You are of your father, the devil. You are believing a lie. Confronted them with the truth. And so all those who claim to be the people of God are not necessarily the people of God. Jesus gave that warning in the Sermon on the Mount early in his ministry. You remember when he said, Many will say unto me in that day, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in your name, cast out demons in your name, done many wonderful works in your name? What did the Lord say? I don't know you. Oh, yes, you do. Let me remind you what we've been doing. The Lord says, I hear you, but I don't know you. In fact, get out of here. Depart from me, you workers of iniquity. Now, what were they doing? They were setting up the terms upon which they claimed to be the children of God. Folks, you and I can't do that. Today in class on the campus, we were discussing the word covenant. And the word covenant, as it's used in the New Testament to refer to our relationship with God, is an agreement we have with God. Now, when I asked the students to give me the answer to the meaning of covenant, the young man that answered, if I were to mention his name, some of you would know who I'm talking about, said, uh, well, there are two covenants. One's a covenant between two parties with which both of them submit the terms of the covenant. The other is a covenant between two parties with only one party determining the terms and the other party simply agreeing to those terms. He was right on target. Now that's the kind of a covenant relationship you and I have with God. Now consider the synagogue of Satan. These are people that say, oh, we are the people of God. Just like a lot of people today believe that if you're born of Jewish parents, physically, nationally, you are God's people. That is not true. Those who are God's Jew, who are God's Israel, are God's Israel on the basis of a spiritual birth, not a physical birth. And this is made abundantly clear in John chapter 3, beginning of the first verse, when Jesus looked to Nicodemus, a Pharisee, a root of the Jews, and said, you've got to be born again. That just overwhelmed him. What do you mean be born again? You don't mean get back in my mother's womb and be born again. No, that's not what I mean. You've got to be born of the water and the Spirit. In fact, you'll not be in my kingdom unless you are born from above. Now that's very clear. And Jesus made that clear during his public ministry to a man that recognized when he came to Jesus by night, he said, you've got to be a man from God. Nobody can do what you're doing unless they be from God. 
What was he doing? Performing miracles. Why is he performing miracles? To convince the world, I am who I say I am. I am God's son. I do bring God's message to you. The message of salvation. The message of hope. So, God works in these wonderful ways to help us come to an understanding of uh, the truth that he has in store for us. And people who think that they can do things their own way and make their own terms to determine what's going to be necessary to be saved, they are so wrong. So what are you going to say to these people? I was asking a question about that earlier this week. My answer was, I'm going to call their attention to John chapter 12, verses 47 and 48. And what did those two verses say? Jesus said, I'm not going to judge you. The words that I have spoken will be your judge on the last day. What words did Jesus speak? The words that God gave him to speak. The words the Holy Spirit told the apostles about so they could put it in writing. And we've got the writing in what we call the Bible. On that basis, we will or we will not be saved. On that basis, we either are or are not the people of God. But it's not for any man to change anything that God has said. And this is why it's so important in our Bible studies to come to a correct understanding of the teaching of God's Word that we might be certain we are living in the will of God and are not like the synagogue of Satan that claim to be the people of God, but are not. They're lying. And the seriousness of the lie is underscored when we get to the end of the last two chapters of the book of Revelation. And all liars will have their place in the lake of fire that burns forever and ever. If there's anything that the Lord hates, it is the lie. Now let me just remind you once again, the best commentary on this verse would be Romans chapter 2, verses 28 and 29, where he tells you exactly what true Israel is, what true circumcision is, not of the flesh, but of the heart. And then again in Romans chapter 9, verses 6 through 9, they are not all Israel who are of Israel. Little play on words. Just because you're born a Jew doesn't make you God's Jew. You become God's Jew today on the basis of the new covenant which requires a new birth, which takes place in our baptism into Christ. Now, what will the Lord do to those who lie? I've already called your attention to the uh, verse, and you have it there in question number four. Uh, Revelation chapter 21, verse 8, which shows the seriousness of the lie. Remember, all the way through the Revelation, now, just as soon as we finish this chapter, we're going to get into the real battle. That's where it really gets exciting. But the tool that God uses to win the battle of the ages is truth. The tool that the devil uses to try to defeat God is the lie. Now he's a master of deceit. He can better than anybody else in all the world tell a lie and make a believer out of you. And one of the tragedies is that so many people have fallen prey to his extreme ability to lie and make you think you're hearing the truth. And the way to really appreciate how that all got started, all you need to do is go back and reread the first three chapters of Genesis. Notice how he made his appearance to Eve, through her to Adam. Did he deceive them? Yeah, he did. Did they know what God had said? Yes, they did. I'm really concerned about those who know, honestly, in their heart, what God has said but they're going to hang on to what some man has told them because they're deceived. And they think, and here's where they begin to play the role of God. God would not punish me. God knows I really mean to do well. Oh, does he? When you allow what some man says to override what he has clearly said, are you trying to mock him? Are you daring to say that you know better than he does? When the Bible makes it very clear that His Word is the basis of our judgment, really very, very serious that we understand the truth. Now in verse 10, Because you have kept my word, or kept the word of my perseverance, I will also keep you from the hour of testing, 
that hour which is to come upon the whole world to test those who dwell on the earth. Now, the promise to those who persevere. Now, persevered is somebody who just keeps on. Never gives up. Doesn't quit. Keeps on keeping on. And what does he say? I am going to keep you from the hour of testing. Now, who's going to be tested? When's that hour of testing going to take place? Folks, I think it's taking place throughout the entire Christian dispensation. I would be surprised if any of you would come up to me and say, well, I've never been tested. I can't, I can't really think that that would be true. Have you never entertained any doubts? Have you never been put on the spot where you could have really stood up for the Lord, but you didn't? Have you ever given in to social pressure, to peer pressure? Have you ever given in to kind of hedging a little bit from what God told you to do? You knew it was wrong. But, oh, well, he's going to forgive me. Tested? Now, folks, sometimes our testing is much more severe than others. But what's the promise given to this church? Here's a strong missionary church. They, they've been obedient. They've kept the faith. He said, I'm going to keep you in the hour of testing. Did God keep Job in the hour of testing? Yeah, he sure did. Did he keep Paul in his hours of testing? He surely did. Did he keep the other apostles in the hour of testing? Yes, he did. And God will do that for us too. But I think this testing goes on every time any kind of a pressure comes to us, to, a, to any degree at all, to kind of let down our guard, to kind of give in. So easy to go along with the crowd. So hard to stand all alone. But sometimes we have to do that. Now, what is meant by the whole world? I think the whole world here simply refers to the world as they knew it at that time, which had been the Roman world. Now, he said in verse 11, I am coming quickly, hold fast what you have, so that no one will take away your crown. Now, the crown here is the crown of victory. That would be eternal life. It's not a royal crown. We know that by the kind of word that is used here. And so he's saying, uh, I'm going to reward your faithfulness. I am going to uh, make sure that uh, you are sufficiently honored uh, with your victory in overcoming the evil one. It will prove to be the kind of thing that will really make you strong in the final analysis. He who overcomes, I will make him a pillar of the temple of my God. He will not go out from it anymore. I'll write on him the name of my God, the name of the city of my God, the new Jerusalem which comes down out of heaven from my God and my new name. He who has an ear to hear, what, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. Now in every one of the letters, he does promise a blessing to those who are overcoming. All of us have to be overcomers. God honors those who stay in the struggle and gain the victory, not because they're so strong, but because the one we serve is so strong. That's why Paul says, I can do all things through Christ who gives me the strength. Now, those who are pillars in the temple of my God, I think a pillar speaks of strength. Peter, James, and John were referred to in the book of Galatians, chapter 2 and verse 9, as pillars in the church. Do we use that term today? Yeah, we do. We use the term to refer to those who, every time the doors are open, boy, you can count on them being here. Have a job to do, you can count upon them being one of the volunteers. I'll tell you, people who are referred to as pillars of the church are very, very special people. I think that God would have all of us be pillars in the church. Always dependable. Always willing. Always ready to serve. Now remember, the temple is the church. In fact, the temple is your body. Now in 1 Corinthians chapter 6 and verse 19... And in 2 Corinthians chapter 6 and verse 8 to 16, we have the word temple used once to refer to all of us together as a group and once to refer to us individually. My body, your body, as a Christian, is the temple of the Holy Spirit. How strong will I be in this body, this temple? Will there be a pillar in this temple stands firm. Now you think about that. The next time you're about to engage 
in a habit or to say a word that you know in your heart does not honor God. Let's pray. Father, you've spoken to us tonight through the letter written to the church in Philadelphia. A church in a city known for brotherly love. And God, what a joy it is to be with these people tonight who are people who love one another. We are, in a sense, tonight, a gathering in Philadelphia. Help us to be pillars in our individual temple and in the temple of the congregation of which we are part. Help us to be strong in our faith. Help us to be overcomers. Help us to live in anticipation of the crown of righteousness that come to those who the Apostle Paul can say, I can do all things through Christ who gives us strength. May that be true of each one. I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you.